but there wasn't a one of them that Jesus couldn't take care of. Amen. Praise his name. Psalms 104. Enter into his gates of thanksgiving and into his course of praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. To be in the Lord's house, and I thank Brother Mike and Sister Kelly for how they've allowed the Lord to use their lives. And uh, I'm not going to take up any more preaching time. Brother Mike, you come around and preach to our hearts, and you pray for him as he comes. And I want to encourage you. I'm not just saying this. I really want to encourage you to be here this week, be here tonight, and every service that you possibly can, because I promise you, if you come hungry, God will feed you. If you come needing help, it's available. If you don't get help in these next few days, it's because you didn't really want it. Amen? But God wants to help you, and we all need help. Amen? All right. Thank you, Pastor. All right. You got your Bibles this morning, Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, it is good to be with you. Uh, looking forward to the week. Hopefully getting to spend a little time with some of y'all and and uh, hear some of your stories. And You'll probably hear a few of mine along the way. But it's good to be back. And I am excited about getting to be a part of, I guess, preparing for the celebration of 100 years. I can say, unless the Lord changes some things, if the Lord tarries and doesn't come back, I've been in a lot of places lately that in a hundred years, if they keep going the way they are, they will not be there in a hundred years. Now, I realize I'm not going to be here either way in a hundred years. May not take that long. I'm getting on the high side of numbers. I'll not tell you how high. You can just speculate on that. But what's in my heart to, to do this week is, is, by the help of the Lord, to, to celebrate some things maybe. And I, and I can't celebrate for you because I've not been here those hundred years. I, I've been around in and out for the last, I don't know, what, 15? How long have you been here now? almost 15 years, uh, but I'm not, I'm not been here, so I'm not coming trying to act like I'm one of you and celebrate in that, but provoke some things, hopefully, that God will bring to mind that are worth celebrating from those past years. But in doing so, keeping in mind that what are the generation that's coming behind us, those generations coming behind us going to have to celebrate in days to come because of what we've done. What God allowed us to be a part of, what God allowed us to do. My concern is, as I cross the country, and again, I I was just here a year ago in revival meeting. I didn't record who come all week or who didn't come all week. But I know the trend is this, is that the trend of the nation seems to be that the more aged folks, they will seem to attend more frequently and more regularly than the younger folks actually do. Because over the last generation, and I believe even the latter part of my generation, is that we got so outside of church-minded in our life and involved in work and play, and I'll say play a lot when it comes with this current generation is that those things have taken the precedent. And if we're not careful in years to come, if that continues, there'll be nothing to celebrate in years to come. Now, I have been around this long enough. I just finished up 29 years. I'm in my 30th year of preaching. And I've learned some things along the way. When I first pastored, I thought, somehow I can get people to be faithful. Somehow, I can get people to come. And I tried it all. I tried on bragging. Well, I'm glad you come. I'm thankful that you come. I tried shaming. I noticed you weren't here. Where was you? 
And I found out one thing about the natural man is if I tell you you need to do something, your natural inclination is going to be, I'll show you who's boss. We're talking in Sunday school this morning about the problem that Jesus had with his disciples. They kept looking for the kingdom. They wanted him to set up his kingdom. And they were continually disappointed because he he wasn't setting up the kingdom. And he kept trying to get them into service and they're wanting to get out of service. Just set up your kingdom. They were more concerned about the seating position in the kingdom to come than they were their serving position in the current kingdom. And it all come down to really this, is that sometimes, even with what's going on in Israel, is a lot of people are looking for maybe him to come and set up his kingdom, but we're actually looking in the wrong vein. Because the disciples wanted this. Lord, set up your kingdom so you can do things now my way. If you want his kingdom to come, it obviously, according to his model prayer, that he give us to pray, it can come anytime you want it to. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can have a kingdom relationship with Christ today. He said, well, I, I hope he'll come. Well, he can. And you don't have to wait till he comes bodily. He can come spiritually into your life and take over today. (laughs) But they didn't want him to come take over in here. They just wanted him taken over out there. (laughs) But I'm just telling you, before he ever takes over out there, he's wanting to take over in here. So if you want him to come, you just ask him this week, Lord, where do you, you want me to be? They want me to be there. My kids want to go there. My flesh wants to go home and go to bed. Whether y'all believe it or not, this body is just as much flesh it is as yours. It was not a matter of convenience to come. That may shock you, I don't know, but I live in Wyoming and I'm here. And I drove, I didn't I didn't fly. And I won't get home till next month. And I'll leave after three weeks and not be home for three months. It's not about convenience. It's about a kingdom. And what he wants to do in our life. So the best thing we can do for the generations that are coming behind us is that whether the Lord comes tomorrow or whether he comes in ten years. I keep saying it this way when people bring it up. I say, Lord, well, I'm ready either way. I'm ready to go home today if he wants me to go home. I'm ready for him to come if he wants to come. I'm ready to serve and stay if that's what he wants me to do. Joshua chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 1. I'm going to read several verses just kind of beginning to lay a foundation. And Lord willing, this week we'll we'll, we'll be right in this same chapter. It said, and it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, I, I point out here that what he said and what he's about to say, he didn't say on that side of Jordan. He said it on the far side of Jordan, where they have just crossed over to. Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. And Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And I'm going to feature verse 6 kind of in a different way this morning. We'll get deeper into it tonight. But it says that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them that 
The waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and it, when it was passed over Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel for what? Forever. In other words, he's doing something today that he wants to last forever. He wants what he's doing today to benefit generations forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. I want to point out verse 9. Lord willing, we'll deal with this Wednesday night if he doesn't change anything. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua and the people hasted and passed over. I'm going to stop reading there. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for just how our hearts were already encouraged. Just getting here a little bit earlier and hear Miss Teresa practice. And uh, I'm glad that I have some hope that's in you. And Lord, you really are the only hope we have of anything good in these days to come. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us in these services, Lord, that God, you'd help us to have a, an honesty about our life, about where we really are, and honesty about where other people are around our life. God, that's really when revival comes, when we can get honest with you about how things really are. And I pray you'd have your way this morning. And Lord, begin us in a direction for the week that you'd have us to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The messages that I'm dealing with this week in the context of, of what I'm doing, it, it, it's a historical moment in the children of Israel's lives. They're finally getting to a place that they've been laboring for over 40 years to get to. And they're finally arriving there. And God's going to mark it. And he said, I, I want you to mark this historical day and, and I want to do it in such a way to where you're going to stack some stones and, and, wh and what you're going to do is that from now on when people see this stack of stones, they're going to ask some questions and I want you to be able to give an answer. He's going to write a message, not in stone like the Ten Commandments, but he's going to write a message with stone. He does that in other places in the Bible. He said, raise up an Ebenezer there to, to remind people of things. And, and so it, it, there's other places in the Bible that he does that. But, but there are three in here that God's given me that I want to deal with. One of them is the message of the stacked stones on the far side of the river. We'll really start getting into that tonight. And then as I'm studying this, he, he, it's like he highlighted, I don't know if you've ever done it before, where you read portions of the Bible, and, and it was there the whole time you've read them, but I didn't see it before. And, and there was a portion in here to where Joshua just, I, I pointed it out as I was reading, he stacks 12 stones in the midst of the river, and it really doesn't say much anything else. I guess that had always got clouded in the 12 stones being stacked on the other side of the river, and I really never saw that as a separate thing. But he's going to stack... 12 stones in the midst of the river, and there's going to have some significance. But, but what I'm interested in dealing with this morning, it's not the message of the stacked stones on the far side of the river. It's not the message of the stacked stones in the midst of the river. But it's really something God began to speak when I first started studying this about the message of the unstacked stones. Or could I say it this way, the message of the unseen stones of the past generation. You got your Bible, go back. Verse 6. He said that this may be a sign among you that when, and he's very specific, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by this stones? He's talking to this generation. And he said, now, this generation, you're going to unstack the stones. And when the children are going to ask you, that next generation are going to ask you what mean these stones, then you're going to give them the answer. But what I began to understand as I, I was listening to this is that there's a generation that's missing from this scene that could have been in this scene. 
Because this is not the first time the children of Israel have got the opportunity to go to the promised land. It's not the first time they had been at that point to where they had got possibly to the brink of the Jordan. We don't know if they would have crossed the Jordan with that first generation. I would have speculate they would because the second generation, that's the way God brought them through. But they never got to the place to where they're going to cross the Jordan. And so they never got to the place to where they're ever going to see the stone. So that generation is never going to actually be able to tell the story about the stones because you can't talk about what you've never seen. You got your Bible back to... Numbers, I, I find it interesting. I'm not going to ask if you remember what I preached last year. But I remember what I preached last year. And on Sunday morning of last year, I began, strangely enough, in Numbers chapter 13. And last year we were leading up into Gideon and dealing with fear, but I'd like to feature because, again, where we're going in, in Joshua chapter 4, this generation that's going to make their choices here. Numbers chapter 13, verse 16. Numbers chapter 13, verse 16. These are the men, the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and sent, uh, said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the Lord what it is and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that dwell in it, whether it be good or bad, and in what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether they be wood therein or not. And be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And I want you to know this. So they went up, they searched the land from the wilderness of Zin, and Rehob as men cometh to Hamath. Now chapter 14, verse 1, it said, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and, uh, and the people wept that night, and the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation, and they said, unto them, would to God that we'd have died in the land of Egypt, or would to God we'd have died in this land. Verse 4, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and do what? Let us return into Egypt. Now I'm saying that generation that we're looking at in Joshua chapter 4, this generation that I'm talking about in Numbers chapter 13, they are not there. Because they have all died out. He's not going to give them instructions about how to stack the stones. He's not going to give them instructions about how to tell the story. He's not going to do that because this generation here is not there in, number, in uh, uh, Joshua chapter 4. Now they heard the words that God said. They know where they're supposed to go. We are supposed to go. We know the names of the people that are supposed to go. And they're representative, as in Joshua chapter 4, of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're going to have 12 men again that are going to be involved, and they're going to be represented. So every family has the opportunity to be involved in what God is doing. And so those 12 men, they heard the words to go. They heard the words of where they're supposed to go. They learned the words of how they're supposed to go, be strong and of good courage, and, and you go out. And they heard the words of what they're supposed to bring back. There's some things that they're supposed to bring back. They're supposed to bring back a report of the things that they've seen, and they're going to bring back some of the fruit of the land that they have viewed. And they go and they do all of that. They do part of it. But there's part of it that they don't do. They don't cross the Jordan, they don't go to the promised land, they decide that it'd be better if we stopped here and turned around to go back from the direction that we came. They have forsaken them. And the reason they've done that in Numbers chapter 14, verse 3, I read, he said, At wherefore hath the Lord brought us up unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said, 
one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that I, I really don't want you to answer out loud, but let the Holy Ghost answer it in your heart. Have you and any of you, like the children of Israel, ever been given something by God that you know that he wants you to do? That may be to witness to somebody. It may be to invite somebody to church. It might be in a service where he said, has anybody got anything on your heart that you'd like to say, that you'd like to, uh, to, to give a testimony of the Lord? And in your heart, you, you knew the Lord had said, I want you to do that. I, I've got a way that I want you to go. It could be that somebody may have felt the call to preach. And, and I certainly did that for a while. I knew that God wanted me to preach. I didn't want to preach, but I knew who it was that was talking to me. And, and so I was in a rebellious part to where I didn't know that. Or maybe it was at the end of the service and, and a preacher's preached and, and he said, you know, the invitations come. Anybody that needs to come and talk to the Lord. And you knew the Holy Ghost was doing this to you and, and, he, and he wanted to talk to you here. He didn't want to talk to you back there. So well, I can talk to him anywhere. No, you can't. You can talk to him where he wants to be talked to at. It's not that he can't hear you. He just won't. And so... It may be somebody here this morning, you've never been saved, but you've been convicted about your salvation. And you're in a place to where you know he wants you to come in that direction, but, but you stand afar off and you're going, no, I don't want to do that. That's where this generation, they, they got to the place to where they knew the direction that one got, uh, God wanted them to go. They heard everything that he said. He knew what he wanted them to do. They were just afraid of doing that. Last year we dealt with how to deal with fear because fear is going to come to everybody that's a Christian. Have anybody in here, and I'm not asking you to tell me, have anybody in here ever had God want you to do something that you didn't do? The thing that, I, it may be even this week, as again, he may want you here for a service that you don't want to come to. and You're going to have to make a choice of, of what you're going to do. And you'll have the freedom to make that choice. But as you hear preachers say from time to time, you may get to choose to sin, but you do not get to choose the consequences of those sins. And when it comes to that time, here's the choices that you'll make. You'll make the choice to substitute your will for his will. God wanted to go into Canaan. They said, I believe I want to go back to Egypt. How come? Because I kind of know Egypt more than I know what lies ahead. There's a lot of uncertainty there. I may have been enslaved over there. It may have not been great over there, but at least I knew what it was like over there. And so I, I'm just going to turn around and go. We substitute our will for his will. And when we do that, we substitute our way for his way. You can't go with God from that point, so you have to do what they did. We need to elect some new leadership. We need a change in leadership. How come? Because that leader is not wanting to go where I want to go. But I want you to understand when they, when they make that choice, they're never going to see what's in the river. And they're never going to experience what's in the river. And they're never going to experience what's on, si on the other side of the river. Because here's the thing about these stones. I hadn't really ever thought about it until God took me through this study of, uh, uh, about these stones. Is that you cannot and will not ever see these stones by walking by the river. Because they're in the midst of the river. They're not on the shore of the river. One of the things that I learned is not only will you not see these stones just walking by the river, you would not see them even if you boated across the river. They're never going to be seen. And what on the other side are never going to be experienced until you get your feet in the river. They didn't even know they were there. They're going to find out about them once they get to the other side of the river. The significance is going to come on that side. It doesn't come on this side. And what, what's the sad part of that is, is that 
for 40 years, they're going to walk around from that point with no story to tell. And with no liberty in their life of arriving at the blessings of God. For 40 years, they personally are not going to experience God. Now understand, they are around God for 40 years. And you can be around God and not experience the blessings of God. Because they don't have the promise. They don't have the peace. They don't have the hope. They don't have all the things that God had designated for over there. That's going to be when you get over there. And I, I'm saying if we're not careful, we can hang around church and we can be around church for 40 years. We can be around church for 30 years. We can be around church for 10 years and never really get the benefit of what it is to be in church. Because our life is just hung out around God. And not really with God. In fact, I think that's sometimes what the struggle is for folks that that can come maybe this morning but would have trouble coming in another service. Is because in your heart and in your mind, there, there's some perceived benefit of being here for this service. But there's no perceived benefit of being in those other services. See, the problem is, is when that's our... Our line of thinking is that you don't know. It's what he's trying to emphasize. You don't know what you're going to miss. You say, well, I I can just listen to it later. You're not going to get it by walking by the river. You're not going to get that by floating by the river. You're going to have to be in the river. Until you've been in the river... That blessing won't come. And I I promise you, that's not a prop trying to get you to have more attendance here. Because if all we have is more attendance during the meeting, that's all we're going to have at the end of the week is more attendance in the meeting. What's going to have to happen is that we meet with God and we we, we come where God's told us to come and we do what God would have us to do. And, And because of that, we experience the thing that God wants us to experience this week. But they lived their life around the things of God for 40 years, but never got the real blessing because they substituted his goal for theirs. My goal is just to stay alive and live life the way I want to live it. And I can't do that going over there. I'm going to have to go back there. We're going to have to head back toward Egypt. See, some of the consequences were is that these people, and that's what's so sad about it, that, that were once enslaved by where they were in Egypt. And they were crying out by the reason of their infliction. That there was a holy God come and heard their cry, and he came and delivered them in a very miraculous way out of Egypt. That's where it got me. I was a slave to sin. I was on a road to nowhere. When he got me, I was shaking my fist in his face and draining every bit of life I had out of every late relationship that I had, and I was giving it to alcohol and giving it to bitterness, and I was giving it to anger. That's where I was. But thank God he came where I was that night. Locked up in that cell, and he freed me in more ways than one. I found some deliverance, and everyone that had that's in this group had experienced that deliverance. I call it, they had had their Red Sea experience. They crossed the plain that they couldn't get across by themselves. It was an uncrossable plain. They were on this side and destruction was headed in that direction. But thank God, God opened up the Red Sea and made a way for them to be delivered from that. And I say hallelujah, thank God that God made a way for me to be delivered. He made a way for me to have more than what I did. Thank God. And I, I celebrate that and I'm grateful for that. If you're not careful, you can get in your life, you'll get to a point to where somehow memory begins to fail you. The devil is good at presenting things very wrongly. 
Because Israel from time to time, they would talk about Egypt not as the place that they were in bondage. But somehow in their mind, it began to think about that was the place where they had it made. And that flesh desired to go back in the wrong direction. But the choice that they're going to make, it's going to cost them 40 years of the blessings of God. But I think even sadder than that is not that it cost their generation 40 years of the blessings of God. It cost the generation behind them 40 years of the blessings of God. I remember telling that at, at a young couple that was in my church when I pastored many years ago. They'd been faithful to church. They got saved. And then her daddy had passed away and they got a evidently got a large sum of money from her dad passing away. And their life began to change, not for the better. They began to have more kids, but then they quit coming to church. And I remember writing them a letter. I said, listen, I want you to understand the choices that you're making. You've been saved. You have been delivered by God, but you're you're going to rob your children of the same opportunity to have what you have by making the choices that you're making. You're going to rob a generation that's behind you from having the blessings of God. For 40 years, this generation is going to go nowhere. They call it wandering, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, wandering. They're going nowhere. And tomorrow when they get up, they're going to go nowhere. And next year when they get up, they're going to go nowhere. And you know why they're going to go nowhere? Because of the choices of the generation that was before them. They're going nowhere. And for 40 years, they've gone nowhere. Because of the choices of that generation. Our generation is, that this current generation is getting more angry. They're more confused in every aspect of life. I've never seen a generation that is, uses the word bored more than this current generation. I honestly don't ever remember in my life growing up using that word bored. But man, it is a constant of the present generation, but of being bored. Do you know why they're bored? Because they're going nowhere. Because of the choices of this generation that's taken it away from God. Going nowhere for 40 years because of the choices that their, their fathers and their mothers made before them. On this side, never experiencing the blessings that God had intended. I li we live in a day, and I, I'm not mocking, not making fun of anybody. If you're in that situation, that, that's why I'm preaching here. That's why I'm here. We live in a time to where there's more anxiety in the life of people than I've ever seen before. They're, they're, they're concerned on all levels. They're just frightened of everything. Because that's the way the choices of that generation was. They were afraid to do the will of God. And so when they were afraid to do the will of God, then they lived within the choices of that fear for 40 years. The consequences of that. I'm just saying that they died wandering, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, rather than wandering, W-O. N D E R I N G. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about getting to view God daily. Getting to view what God can do daily. Here's the way much of Christianity lives today. You watch the news today and you live in fear of tomorrow. And you watch the next day and you're more fear 
You're more concerned because it's getting more violent out there. It's getting to where you're afraid to walk in certain places that you used to be able to walk. You're afraid to talk to people because you don't know how they're going to react because people are acting so violently. And so we live in the place to where we just are cocooning ourselves in to where we don't participate in any of those kind of things because we don't have a God that's big enough in our life to be able to see what God can do in view of the life that we're living in. One of the advantages that God has given me, I don't really call it advantage or disadvantage, I'm forced into this a lot. Because the nature of what I do, I go, I go up to the Eskimos and go into these villages where, uh, again, I don't blend in. I, I'm not like everybody else. I, I, I'm somebody that they despise from the time I get there because of what the white men do to them. But how in the world do I have any success up there? When I went to the last village, I was there. And, and it was a village that, that had been taken captives by Christians, supposedly. The Catholics had come in and they'd taken all their kids and they took them to these villages and they stripped them of their clothes, they stripped them of their, their native foods, they st- stripped them of their language, and then they stripped them of their dignity as they raped and molested them. How in the world is a white guy like me going under the name of Christianity going to be able to go in anywhere like that and see any measure of success? In my natural flesh, absolutely no hope. Of myself, absolutely no help. But yet this last village that we went into, when we went there, there were seven coming to the church. When we left there, there was 30 some coming to church regularly. And how did God do that between the time that we got there and the time that we left? The pastor has said, since he's got back there, it seems to have continued. Now they don't have room for the people that they have. They're going to have to try to figure out how to, how to manage it. They're tearing out some walls because people are having to stand. They're not even able to sit. How could God do something like that? Because i got a big God that can do things that you and I have never seen and you and I may have never heard heard of, but you've got to put your foot in the water to be able to see it done. And we got way too many Christians that are not getting their feet wet anymore. That comes to the brink, they come to the bank and God wants you to go further with the Lord than where you are. And you say, well, that looks scary. I'm not sure about that. I'm afraid of this or I'm afraid of that. And you take your little toes and you turn around. And you say, I just don't see how it's going to work. It's because you never got your feet wet. You got to get your feet wet to see the deliverance that God's going to rock. How come? Because we quote it all the time. His ways are not. You know the text. The problem is, is it's just not real in our life. Because when that time comes, we make the choices that their fathers have made. They died wandering instead of wandering. The absence of the story is going to mean there's an entire generation that's never going to be able to tell the story that the next generation is going to be able to tell. They could have. They should have, but they didn't. And this is what got me to thinking, and believe it or not, I'm about done for this morning. Is that it got me to thinking about the generations that were before me. You see, I grew up in church. It wasn't a question of whether we were going to church. We were going every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Youth night, vacation Bible school, we were there for everything. That's just the way I was brought up. And so my mom and daddy took me to church every time the church doors were open, as long as I can remember. And as long as I can remember, my grandma and my grandpas on both sides went to church. Sunday morning, if they had Sunday night, they went. If they had Wednesday night that they went, they were there. My grandpa on my daddy's side was a deacon in the church. My grandpa on my mother's side was never really involved in the church, but he was always there. He was, he was always faithful. My grandma and my grandpa on my mother and father's side were both married for 60 years plus. They stayed together. 
my mom and my dad just celebrated their 58th, I guess it is, wedding anniversary. They've been together long term. They were in church all the times that it was available to them. But when I got to thinking about it, I believe they love me. I love them. Respect them. Do you know my grandpa and my grandma on my daddy's side, the one that was a deacon, never took me to a stack of stones and said, let me tell you about what God did. Not once did they ever take me to a stack of stones that would cause me, what meaneth these stones? Tell me about what special thing that God did. I got to think about on my mother, my mother's side, my grandmother and my grandfather on my mother's side in church all their life that I knew of. Never took me to a stack of stones that would cause me to say, what meaneth these stones? Tell me about what God did that calls that to happen in your life. My dad, who's been in church all my life, never took me to a stack of stones. He's still living. I've watched some things happen over the last year. I've never seen him, my dad, before. But my dad has never took me to a stack of stones and said, let me tell you about what God did that was special that nobody else could do. Do you understand how many Decades of church that represents. And yet not one stack to cause anyone to ask about the God that they serve and why he's so special. Is it any wonder why our generations are the way that they are? Because I believe it was not just my home where people went through the motions of going to church. They did the things they were told to do, but never got to the place that their life crossed a place to where they started living a different way, to where they got to see things done on a higher level. And because of that, there's an effect on another generation that's there. Now, thank God, and that's where we're going to tonight, is that God gives that next generation a choice to make themselves. But I want to ask you this, as I'm getting ready to stop for this morning and we'll unplug and come back tonight. What I'm interested in this morning is is about you. I'm not asking if your mother and father loved you. I'm not asking about whether you loved your mother and father. You may have had a good one. You may have had a bad one. I I, I don't know this. My, My question is this. Did they ever take you to their spot where you would ask about their stones? Did they live a life to where it just had those special places, those special spots to where it just calls you to want to know, how did that happen? And I'll ask you this for you as we get ready to close. Have you ever taken anybody to your spot? Has anybody ever asked about your spot? And if they haven't, it could be because you don't have one. You can't talk about stones that you've never seen. And you can't stack stones that you've never encountered. And I say this, I really believe in America, you can talk about Democrats, Republicans, all you want to. That's not the problem we have. He quoted it earlier. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, this wasn't Republicans and Democrats that caused them to be in captivity. Wasn't Republicans and Democrats that caused them to wander for 40 years. It was their relationship with their God that caused them to wander. And I'm interested 
this week. If this church, as Lord willing, we get into the other ones, hopefully will cause you to celebrate some things. We, we've got to look to this generation ahead of us and, and ask the question, are they going to have anything to celebrate? In 20 years, will there be stones that have been stacked in the lives of people here that wasn't stacked in their presence before? We need some people that can say something about God. But it sure helps if you've first seen something about God. I think that's why they call it witnessing. It meant you've seen something. You've been somewhere, you saw something, you experienced something, and because we've experienced it and I can testify about it. But this generation, it said, uh, let me go back over to Joshua chapter 4. I'll read it one more time and then we'll close. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what ye mean ye by them these stones? Verse 7. Then ye shall what? Answer them. As we stand, heads bowed, I'm going to pray. But Todd's going to come. I'm going to ask you, if they come and they ask you today as you go home, your grandchildren or your children, and they say, Daddy, Mama, where are the stones in our life? Are you going to have anything to say? And I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you don't. What I'm trying to say is that if you don't, we need some. It means we're missing out on some things. It means they're missing out on some things. And so I may have to start with saying, Oh, Lord, I, I don't have any real stones. I... I got saved, and I'm glad I can tell about that, but I really don't have any experience with God outside of that day. Then might it be that God birthed something in our heart this week, that there would be a revival of people willing to get their feet wet. Willingness for people to go where God wants us to go to do what God wants us to do. It could be somebody here that's lost and you've never been saved. And you know he's done this number. But you've never really experienced him in your life because you've never put your foot in the Jordan. You've never took that step that he's asked toward him to get what God wants from you. May it be today, tonight, or somewhere in the near future... You get the strength to make that. I promise you, you're going to see things you've never seen and you're going to experience things you've never experienced. You say, preacher, does that mean everything's good? Oh, no. <laughs> but it sure is godly. And it sure is distinctly him. Father.